Okay. Okay, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce my colleague Wolfgang Salter from Marvell. He's a package engineer um, and the integration architect at uh, the Marvell's new uh, ASIC business unit. Uh, he works on advanced packaging solutions and chip interface de definition for all ASIC projects that require integration of multiple active components. Uh, before Marvell, uh, Wolfgang worked as a package engineer at IBM and as an integral member of the customer engineering solution team, um, CEST, at Global Foundries and at Avera Semi. Uh, he has authored more than 30 industry papers and publications and more than 120 patents. Now, uh, Wolfgang, um, you, have, you have the baton, go for it. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Chuck. And uh, first of all, thank you um, for sharing your dinner hour with me and, and uh, listening to me while you hopefully munch a little bit in the background. And I couldn't agree more with Dave that, that, um, that we get back to in-person meetings, especially forums like this is, is much, much more fun in person um, where you can really exchange and, and then afterwards get together. But, but uh, I'll do my best and hopefully uh, it'll be entertaining to you. Um, I have not tried to be extremely deep um, with today's presentation. I'd rather uh, be a little bit more uh, overall uh, covering, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the, find the right buttons. We just did it before, but now of course it's off. Um, yeah, really, really trying more to, to uh, hit a, a wider, um, a, a bigger picture um, than, than just really packaging or very uh, niche um, technology focused. So I hope, I hope my screen came up. Is it visible for everybody? Yep, looks good. Okay, cool, good. Um, so I uh, didn't know what I should call it today. So I call it Scaling Revisited because everything about packaging these days really doesn't revolve around the package. It really revolves around uh, the chip or a number of chips and how you get them back together. But um, in terms of agenda, first, I wanted to spend a little bit of time introducing myself and kind of where I come from, what I did, even so Chuck has already done that, but a little bit more. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the status of the industry. Where, where are we right now? Um, and what does it mean and how does it influence um, what, what's going on? And then I wanted to go more into the a somewhat more technical piece of uh, partitioning, so chip partitioning and, and packaging. So first, uh, my path, a little bit of uh, my background, where I came from, I started at IBM in the year 2000, about 15 years ago. I spent about 15 years in, in package development. And back then I was uh, still a real engineer. I uh, really worked on the details on, on alloys, fluxes, phase diagrams. And, and all of the things that really require deep analysis and thinking. But back at the time, I had really no idea what any of that was needed for, right? And I think that's a, it's a pretty typical um, a phase of, of uh, engineer who is really deep uh, down in the details, but um, oftentimes you don't get the big picture until you leave that role and go somewhere else. So that happened for me. Um, in, in the year 2015, um, when um, IBM decided to sell uh, the um, semiconductor business to Global Foundries, and that moved me from um, a package-centric role that IBM had its own package development organization and manufacturing plant to uh, a different role because Global Foundries did have no interest in, in manufacturing packaging. So it was. Um, I had to learn something different and decided to spend a few years in, in product solutions. So coming up with um, trying to understand what the customer really wants the chip to do and uh, finding the right solution. How do, you, how do you implement that best? And that was a very painful long time of, of learning because it was a really totally different language from, from what I was used to. Um, words that are conventional for all of you probably like service, uh, serve. <laughs> 30s and interfaces and um, pico joule per bit and, and all these uh, terms didn't mean a thing for me as a packaging engineer. So um, 
I spent those four years honestly being the dumbest guy in the room, and that was probably the best thing I could have ever done, and the most interesting and, and biggest opportunity to learn stuff. Um, then um, Global Foundries decided to spin us out as Avera Semi. Um, that took about a year before they were able to sell us off. Um, so there was another year of, of learning opportunity before eventually uh, we now ended up being at, in Marvell. Um, so that's our ASIC business unit that was spun out of Global Foundries, became a Verisemi, and then became Marvell. So Chuck and I are both in the uh, ex well, ASIC business unit and, and associated design centers at Marvell. Um, I still work on product solutions, um, but now I kind of really don't know anything about packaging materials anymore. So my kind of origin got lost a little bit, um, but it's nonetheless exciting and interesting. So along with these um, moves in uh, through different companies, um, of course, office locations changed a few times along the way. Um, I did overlay the uh, Google map and it happened to be all in the same three buildings. So my entire career path so far measures 336 meters and 95 centimeters. Um, that was, of course, only until um, um, COVID hit, and now we all work from home, so it's a lot further. And I'm very excited when we come back from uh, working from home, we will actually be on a new site, a new facility in uh, Burlington at the waterfront, so a very exciting move. And the first time we won't be working out of 1960s uh, IBM-style buildings, so we're actually pretty excited about that move. So um, then after I decided um, I would call this talk uh, scaling or scaling revisited, I wanted to look at what scaling actually means to most people. And I was surprised because we use it like whatever, five times a day, that word. Um, but if you Google scaling, the first 20 links will actually tell you it has to do with cleaning your teeth. And then the next few will go into the culinary as aspect of scaling. Um, or some kind of dermatological aspect of it. But scaling is really like we are very uh, outnumbered in, in uh, number of people who use that word. Um, so in, in the context that we use it for is really much more focused on business and technology. And I also thought that was a little bit interesting um, that anytime you use scaling in the business sense, the arrow points like very strongly upwards versus for us, it always points down. So I thought that was kind of a, a funny, funny aspect of scaling. And this is, of course, an outer, outdated map, right? Going to 10 nanometer. We're uh, now finishing design on seven. We're working on five nanometer, and we've started coding on three nanometer already. So continues to go very, very fast down that that process node scale. The, the, the question is really what do you what are you trying to scale because a, a chip doesn't have an inherent desire to be um, in a in a small technology node that just makes it expensive but what what is it the customer is really trying to do or to get to is it performance is it cost is it size is it power um, and while that's generally within one particular customer group or application space. Um, all customers tend to go in the same direction. Uh, between one application space and another application space, it's dramatically different. Right? Some of the um, um, wireless applications are maybe much more focused on size or power versus some of the AI um, um, products really want the performance and, and other spaces need the cost to be the most important. So. So I don't think there is a unilateral answer to that question, but generally within one application uh, space, um, they tend to hold um, true. Good. Um, so this is information that everybody has seen a thousand times already, right? Um, the evolution of how many fabs exist to produce any particular technology node, I'm just using it um, to introduce, um, you know, transition to packaging later on. Um, but it's always good to, to think about it um, also uh, again and again, because um, while at 180 nanometers, we had a ton of suppliers for the technology node. 
now in, in 10, 7, and, uh, and 5, we're down at three suppliers and, and expect to go down to only two suppliers in the world at, at three nanometer. Interestingly, also, if you look at them on a map, all of these suppliers, um, not only the, the three suppliers for the leading silicon nodes, but also all the packaging suppliers are located on this uh, ring of fire. Um, so on, on geologically unstable areas that will get hit by uh, earthquakes or tsunamis or, or, or other events. So it's, it's, it's quite remarkable that, that everything we need for technology in, in our industry <laughs> it comes from right that uh, that area. Um, the, the, the reason why there's fewer and fewer suppliers, of course, is related to the incredible investment that's needed to build a fab. Um, so the uh, capex for the announcement TSMC has made to build that fab in, in, in Arizona, it's a five nanometer uh, fab. Um, is the official word is 12 billion, but I've seen numbers all the way up to 36 billion. I don't know if that includes future um, uh, future expansion plan plans, but you know we were in in um, numbers uh, that are so high that it would rival um, some smaller countries' GDP. Actually, a whole <laughs> lot of smaller countries' GDP. It's it's such an incredible investment. Um, that, of course, uh, leads to some concerns also. Um, if there are so few suppliers, if they're so big, uh, will they play with you? Will you get their attention? Will they customize any solution for you? Um, do you have alternatives? For example, if you've already um, had past experience with, with Samsung, you don't like them, you went to TSMC and now you have a problem with them, there really is no fallback plan for you. You're out of options. And then, of course, lastly, the, the Gorilla uh, attitude, right? Very similar to will they play with you? Um, but do you have any chance of competing for attention against an Apple or, or similar large customer? Will you get, get the time of the day to really um, be heard? So um, that's the silicon uh, side. Um, this chart, I unfortunately never got to uh, finish it, but I just wanted to show a little bit of what's happening with the recent scaling. Um, so the evolution from seven nanometers to five to three. Um, in, in terms of process time, it gets slower and slower because they just become so complex with UV and multi-patterning. Uh, these smaller nodes, this is uh, how many days per, per mask level it takes, and it's almost doubling between seven nanometer and three nanometer. So getting incredibly complex. Um, I did think about also pulling in uh, a, a graph comparing how many mask layers it takes, but surprisingly that number actually stays pretty constant across technologies. And that just has to do with um, UV coming on board. So rather than doing multi-patterning, so multiple masks for the same layer, um, multiple masks get replaced by one incredibly expensive EUV process tool. So that's why that number doesn't necessarily go up. Um, then development, chip development cost is, is another huge one. So this is here in millions of dollars. Um, so it is expected, to, so this is, Obviously, not just for not for for us or for hardware. This is uh, for a, an end customer who wants to uh, build a, a chip with full um, software support and verification and everything. Those are usually the bigger pieces, but you're looking at anywhere from 500 to a million to to a billion dollars to develop a chip in, in the newest technology node. And then I apologize, I didn't. Uh, you find the time to, to finish up the product design schedule. But I think that's also a really interesting one that we um, see now in, in these new nodes. Um, because these projects get so much more complex, um, it takes the customer much, much longer to execute those designs and it takes us longer to execute those designs. And they also get so expensive that everything needs to be vetted out much, much more. So you can't just risk you know, cutting masks for $15 million for a five nanometer chip and then finding a mistake and then you know, reprinting $15 million worth of, of, of um, lithography masks. Um, so so the, 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 the time it takes to do a, a full design 
were from quoting, from architecture to quoting to, through execution becomes much, much longer, which then also means that um, there's going to be fewer chips that will become available um, for you to build, um, and, and they're going to be much, much more expensive. Um, so, so that is, I think, quite an interesting dynamic that we see um, while the span between one product and the next product from one customer may have been you know, a year, year and a half. Now it's going to be two years or two and a half years because everything needs to be so much more, um, so much better and well thought, thought through before you can make that investment. And it takes longer than. Um, now I wanted to um, lead a little bit into the worldwide market right now. Um, so this is kind of the, the semiconductor uh, revenue um, th over the last two years and then uh, protection to this year. Um, surprisingly, um, during the COVID year when so much was uh, shut down, there was actually uh, roughly 8% growth in the semiconductor market. Um, and then this growth is actually going to accelerate, uh, projected to accelerate in 2021 with double digit growth this year. Um, which is of course fantastic for, for our industry and, and what we work on, um, but it also leads to, to some issues, right? Um, but before we get there, um, one of the good parts about this uh, increase in demand is of course the stock market. This is just showing the uh, Marvell uh, stock price uh, since, um, um, well, Chuck joined Marvell in November of 2019. Uh, then um, a few months later, Chuck uh, decided to actually start working. So that's when the trend reversed a little bit. And it was really, really good until uh, Chuck took a vacation day um, a couple of weeks ago. But I think mostly the, the stock market has recovered from, from that. So, yeah, I, I apologize to our shareholders that, you know, the fact I started working caused a dip. <laughs> good, good. Um, so, but um, th this high demand um, does create some problems, right? And, and AJ, I think it was, you, you said you started working for, for Chrysler. Um, so you probably are very familiar with um, the, the lack of parts uh, that the auto industries uh, is, is, well, with shortage, shortage of supply um, and especially automotive industry, right? They, they're so good in the just-in-time ordering, never carrying inventory. And at a time of, of industry shortage, that's a really bad strategy, right? So it's backfiring now. And the projection is that almost 700,000 cars can't be built in the first quarter alone. So if you just think of 700,000 cars and the revenue associated with that because of um, a bunch of fairly inexpensive modules that go into it, most of these are fairly inexpensive. Um, then, then you can you get a feeling for for um, the significance of the supply chain issue that we have right now. Um, <laughs> I threw this in because it matched the the story a little bit. Um, this is an interesting uh, thing my my son told me. Um, he just sold his graphics card. Um, that he purchased more than three years ago. He bought it for $300 and he just sold it for $650. Um, and, and again, here, same, same issue. It's, it's an old thing, but he sold it for more than twice of what he bought it for. Um, but this surge in the Bitcoin um, price um, it just leads to incredible um, opportunity for mining. Um, and, and mining is generally done with a whole bunch of graphics cards. Um, and maybe the last sentence I'll just read without, uh, before I get myself into trouble on what I think about it, but Bitcoin consumes now more electricity than Argentina. So one little aspect of cryptocurrency. Okay, good, finally, let's start talking about packaging a little bit more. Um, Left graph. So, so my favorite um, application space is is the network switch. So that's um, the module that goes into um, where all the data, big data centers, where all the data gets routed to. Come, all the data comes in, needs to go somewhere out somewhere else. So lots of uh, data in, data out. 
Um, and from a packaging perspective, it's a really, really interesting space because it generally drives all the key um, attributes of what we need um, for the next generation. Um, so the left graph kind of is, is just a relationship of what, how much bandwidth the switch needs, which is just a generation, generational um, a question, and then what the resulting package size is. So generally, the more bandwidth you need, that just means you need more signals, more service uh, lanes coming in and out. That that means you need more uh, soda balls on the back uh, bottom of the package. So that that's what drives the package size. So what's currently in production is the left. Um, end of, of the curve. So we're at about 12 terabits per second for data coming through. Uh, you're looking roughly at a 55 millimeter package size. So that's pretty pretty normal. It's, it's not small, it's not huge. Um, and, and then the, the next generation now that we're um, designing and building now, um, some parts, I think Broadcom may have one in production already. So we're looking at 25 terabits per second, which is so. We, and we're, now we're in the in the area of, of 65 to 70 millimeter packages. Um, and then the next generation 50 T switches, they're going to come out. We're starting to quote them. They're going to come out in maybe three years from now, two years from now, um, and they will need incredibly big packages. We're, we're looking at 105 millimeter packages. So. Um, if, if you're not in the packaging world, that may not mean much to you, but I can tell you it is gigantic. It is, it is absolutely huge. And uh, where that uh, runs into a, um, a laminate with a similar supply chain issue is if you think about the um, panel utilization. So how many substrates do you get out of a substrate panel? It's the same question, really the same approach as, as on a wafer. The bigger a chip gets, the fewer chips you get on that wafer, right? So um, actually, if you a good example would be um, if you look at an interposer wafers. Interposer wafers get uh, can get bigger and bigger, right? So TSMC makes interposers, for example, up to uh, three times the size of a radical by stitching them together. And if you make an interposer that's that big, um, you can only get about 15 per 300 millimeter wafer, right? So you get very, very few. You have to process an entire wafer uh, to get just a handful of parts. And, and so exactly the same for substrates. Um, I just picked one supplier and, and uh, they usually don't extrapolate very far out. We can do it manually, but I think this, this curve makes the point. I'm just spending the range from 40 millimeters to 75. So you're getting down to you know 35 or so laminates for for a big panel, um, and, and also here laminates um, it, it's just like wafers um, they they generally don't change sizes for panels they don't make them bigger um, un, until there's a generational switch right so 200 millimeter wafers to 300 millimeter wafers happened whatever 10 years ago 15 years ago. Um, it's going to take a long time before there's going to be another switch and before we go to 450 millimeter wafers. And the same on substrate panels. They don't usually grow. You just get fewer and fewer and fewer of them on a panel. Um, so if you just expand that line out to 105 millimeter substrates, um, right, you can imagine you're probably down in the 10 or so by the time you yield them. So very, very few, and, and that uh, drives them, um, you know, you get much, much, so a supply chain issue, you get many, many fewer parts for each uh, panel. So there's just a supply limitation, but also then there's the cost question, right? Um, how much are you gonna have to pay for that substrate? And um, for these 105 millimeter substrates, we recently quoted a few, and uh, some of the responses came back in the, uh, one to two thousand dollar range, right? Just for that little green plastic thing under the chip. So pretty astronomical cost. Question so, for you. Yeah. So you you said that the package sizes was primarily um, was dominated by the the density of the solder balls. Is is that is the scaling of the solder the solder balls is that pretty much maxed out or can is there is there ways to 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 push that further? 
Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so the problem is actually not so much the soda balls themselves or how you can route to them, it's attaching that package to a board. Um, so you still need these very large, so I'm going to try it again and see if, if, if it actually shows it. So, so if I want to attach this really large module onto a board, it needs to be um, you know, the, the soda balls on the backside all need to join and none of them can short together. So, so if you, if you squeeze them closer and closer together and make them smaller and smaller, the odds of um, them not joining properly is very, very high. And by the time you've built this thing, you've put so much money into that, you don't want to throw it away at that point. So there's uh, efforts. Um, and, and of course, we, we are thinking about that too going forward. How can we avoid that? And um, there's a couple of different um, potential solutions. Uh, one is going to come later in a few pages. But basically it says we can't escape them through soda balls on the bottom anymore. We really have to get them off the top of the package, either in cables or um, in, in, in optical um, fibers. So th that is uh, basically the future of, of what, what your quest, what will answer your question in the future. Thanks. Good. So um, the, the, the other issue with these large laminates is that um, historically we've been, you know, they're always sandwiched. So there's a core in the middle, there's kind of the structural part, and then there's small uh, build-up layers, top and bottom, all the routing layers. So that's usually what this refers to, five to five means a core with a wiring layer on each side, and then five additional fine feature um, wiring layers on top. And, and that just goes to more and more wiring layers, right? So if you take those two pieces together, that we have very, very few um, substrates per panel, and you add additional layers, additional processing on each, um, tells you there's going to be a breaking point somewhere for, for capacity. And we have just hit that breaking point in capacity, honestly. Um, we already kind of went over, you need all the components to make a product, right? Just like with the car before, if you don't get the whatever $5, $10 little um, radio controller, you're not gonna sell the car without it, right? You just can't. Um, and the laminate supply was already quite tight before um, this came on so, so strongly. Um, and we have this overlay now of this laminate complexity increasing significantly. Um, and then there was one of the biggest factories um, that exists for laminates from Union Micron uh, caught on fire uh, in October of last year, further um, constricting supply. So um, really a lot going on all at once. And uh, right now you are uh, just paying much, much more um, for laminates if you get support at all. Right? Same kind of the gorilla question is who is the customer who's gonna get the parts and who is not gonna get the parts. Very interesting to me is um, if you look at the margin across the supply chain, right? So most of us probably work for fabless suppliers on, on the left column. So generally the, the margins um, for those companies is, is usually quite good. Um, if you look at um, the fabs, they have about half that profit margin. Um, but as we talked about before, right, you have to invest $12 billion before you have a fab. So it's a huge investment. Um, and then packaging, meaning OSET and substrate, so assembly side and substrate, they usually have about half of that profit margin, right? So you're looking at roughly 15% profit margin. Um, and these factories are not cheap. A substrate factory to build one, uh, you're looking at a probably 500 million to $1 billion investment. And that for a 15% profit margin is, is just a tough business call. And right? if, if uh, the other players in the field get two or four times that margin. Right? So how, how this will um, rattle out, I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, I find it uh, difficult um, to believe that the, the cost increase that we're seeing right now um, is just going to reverse itself. Um, I don't um, think so. Um, on the other hand, once there is more capacity buildup, 
and um, it's going to be an extremely competitive market again, they are going to be the first to get beaten up over cost again and will compete fiercely. So how this is going to shake up, I don't know. I could see it going either way. But honestly, I think for the, for the health of the industry, I, I would hope for a little bit more uh, balancing in between, between the different supply chain components. Okay, good. Back to packaging again. Um, I want to just uh, <laughs> leave no doubt about where my belief is. I think the future of semiconductors is in multi-chip modules. So meaning more than just one active chip uh, in, in, a, in a package. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, this shows one of the very good reasons. This is a network switch from Marvell, from our, our team in Israel. And um, it's, it's quite interesting because you can see this is a large network switch and then it has a bunch of little sturdy chiplets. So basically um, moving some of the IP that would usually be on the large chip, moving it to smaller chips on the outside um, as, a, as a smaller component. And that allowed them to build a large switch module with 17 chips, but then also a half version where they take the chip and physically cut it in half. So it has like special uh, design features in it to enable that. And then you use half the number of chiplets, but then also create a third of, of that flavor. So with, with really one design, you've now enabled an entire family of products. It's, it's like it's extremely interesting from, an, from a modularity perspective. And if you think back about what we talk about with the, with the durations getting longer, with the chip design getting more expensive, this is exactly what you want, right? You want to design one chip and then be able to use it in a number of different products. So that's one of the key drivers for, for this modular approach in multi-chip modules. Um, another one is what I call um, apple and oranges, um, where different functions just don't always want to be on the same chip. And there's a number of examples. Uh, the best one, what I really like is, is AMD um, and their um, Epic 2 ROM module. Um, most of you must have seen it in different forums, but um, what they did uh, at the time was a couple of years ago, they moved only the uh, processor cores to the seven nanometer node and left um, a big IO chip in 14 nanometer, which, which was a very good call because it, it allowed them um, to very early have all this IP uh, ready and on the shelf, right? It existed in 14 nanometer. They just had to use an existing IO chip and most of these functions in the IO chip don't scale very well. There's a lot of analog content in there, doesn't scale well in technology nodes, and only the processors that really scale very, very well with, with a lot of logic content, um, they were uh, moved to the next node. So from a schedule and a cost and flexibility perspective, that's, that's, it was a, it's, this is probably the best module that exists, really good. Another example is, is if you have analog and RF content, so this um, module has a logic chip in the center, something we're producing also, and um, then data converters get mounted um, in, in the four corner sides here, so they're not mounted yet in this picture. Um, that's another good uh, example um, where um, you don't necessarily want to integrate the data converters into the logic node. Um, they don't always integrate very well. They don't naturally want to be in that node. And you have a number of really good suppliers um, like TI and ADI and, um, and others who, who make these, who make nothing but data converters, or <laughs> some of them don't make anything else. And th but they're really, really good in that. They'll, they're, they'll probably always be better than um, you your, or your company may be. So why not partner with them and, and um, uh, have them provide those components and you, you focus on what you're best and which is the logic chip. And then the last example is, is memory. Um, again, DRAM, like the HBM, this is actually a 3D stacked memory. Um, it's made from, from Hynix and Samsung. So there's five layers of, of memory um, actually on each of these blocks here. Um, they provide an incredible amount of, of uh, memory bandwidth to the logic by being um, integrated on a silicon interposer. So with thousands of wires going across. Um, but this DRAM, you would never want to integrate that into the logic die um, because it's not a good fit for 
uh, the node. It's not a good fit in how many wiring layers you need. Those usually get very, very few wiring layers versus the logic is usually 13 to 15 or so. Um, but also this is a huge amount of silicon. If you just fan this out, right? If you think about five layers of this, if you put them next to each other, it would be gigantic, it would fill a radical just by itself. So, so this is a number of, of different reasons why you, you don't necessarily want to integrate um, everything on an SOC, but you oftentimes wanna keep um, your content separate in, in different chips or, or subcomponents. And then the last one, of course, is, is cost. And, and that just has to do with, with yield. Um, so this is a chip that is pretty much radical size that we're producing. Um, and it is just one chip, but I just played with the graphics a little bit to make a case. Um, if you could, split, if the architecture allowed you to split it into two pieces, um, most likely you'll need an interface between them so that they can talk to each other again. And, and that interface, depending on how complex it is and how big it is, has a huge effect on or downstream effect on how complex of a package you need to, to connect them together. But let's just stay with the, just the chip uh, thought for now. Um, what we've done here is we've, we've actually grown the halves, right? So the question, the obvious question is, of course, um, how did you save cost when you just add silicon area? And it's just uh, has to do with the relative cost per, per square millimeter, how that curve looks. And it's actually slightly exponential. This is a real curve. I just uh, put uh, made it in relative terms. Um, but if you have a very small chip, um, the cost per square millimeter could be one whatever unit. And if you have a very large radical size chip, it's going to be uh, about five times that. Right? So, and that's where this chip was. It was almost radical size. Um, so at that, that those dimensions, they, they yield very poorly and leads to this very high cost per square millimeter versus if I can split it in half um, and add a little bit of interface. So I have, I've gone down from 750 to you know, a little bit more than half of it. Um, all of a sudden you're looking at half of the cost per square millimeter. Right? So it's, it's a huge decrease in, in cost and that just has to do with the, the yield of, of, of large dye. So um, those are the reasons why um, you wanna um, um, have multiple uh, chips in a package, reconnect them in a package. And then we'll switch gears a little bit and go back to my, my favorite market, the network switch. And um, I've already mentioned before, um, these uh, kind of the generations, let's do the orange line first. Um, so we're in production now with the uh, roughly 12T or just 10T. Uh, terabits per second uh, switches. We're working on the 25 terabits per second switches. And then our uh, next generation we started to quote now is 50 terabits per second switches. Um, the, the, the bar graph behind it um, indicates what the 30s speed is. So how fast do the signals run um, on these systems? And there was a huge evolution with, with every generation really. Um, it, it pretty much doubled um, and up until um, um, before the 56 gigabits per second, which is what's just in production now. So before that, when we were only up to like 25, 30 gigabits per second, all the signaling was, was um, an RZ. So only zero, zero, zeros and ones. And, and so the eyes were pretty, pretty big and pretty wide open. Um, as we went to um, 56 gigabit, gigabit per second, we went to PAM4 signaling, right? So now you cut the height of the eye into three pieces. So obviously a lot smaller um, eye opening and really much harder to differentiate what's a zero, what's a one, what's a two, what's a three. Um, and then as we go to um, 100 gigabits per second, uh, which we already use now on, on products, product designs, um, now you squeeze it in, in the X axis, right? So you make it much, much narrower in X, the time, time um, axis. And if you just think about the, or you can very obviously just look at the size of the eye, but you can also play the game of, of throwing darts at them and you throw the same four darts um, while they all hit where you want them to hit on, on the past generations. Um, none of them hit anymore where you wanted them to hit. For, for these much, much smaller eyes, right? So that makes the point 
um, that everything needs to get much, much better. The SIRTI scores need to get much better, any kind of error correction, any kind of preventative, preventative maintenance, but also so on the chip design part itself, but then also um, the, the channel, meaning the, 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 the path that the signal travels from the chip through the package, through the board, to the other package and back up again. Um, that path needs to be much, much better controlled and much, uh, less, ref much less reflections and, and other interferences uh, need to be happened. So it, everything about it needs to be much, much better. And um, so the right graph is pretty much the same as we just looked at uh, with only one bar added. Um, and with that, I want to introduce what is coming next, right? And that Dave leads into your question from earlier. The next generation, we started working now on 224 gigabits per second uh, 30, so it is blazingly fast. Um, I can remember our 30s guys uh, you know, five, six years ago told us that 100 gigabits per second can't be done. Well, we're doing it now. And then they said 200 can't be done. Well, we're working on it now. <laughs> There's always going to be a solution, right? So from, from a a package perspective, um, what the current solutions already drive is, is extremely low loss uh, dielectrics. So, so the package materials need to be very, very low loss. Um, the package has become incredibly large. And with that, and, and with these BGS joining, what I explained before, we need very, very low warpage, meaning low CTE material. They can't uh, contract very different than the chip. Well, they always will, right, because they're organic. And, Chip has a CTE of about two, um, but managing that warpage is, is really, really critical. So you can join it to a board. But so the question really is what happens then at 50T or after 50T, what's the next step? And, and 224 gigabits per second is that next step, but the loss for that um, signal speed will be extremely high. Um, Right now, we're looking with 100 gigabits per second, you can send a signal only about this far. If you double the frequency, you'll get half the distance, right? So that's just not enough. Uh, and, and you'll probably spend half of that um, budget of in just getting from the chip to the edge of the package. And then on the other side, again, from the next package, from the edge of the package to the chip. So you've, you've spent half of that budget already before you even try to go anywhere on the board, right? So the question is, what's the solution for, for that next generation? How do you get from where the data is to, to where the data needs to go? And um, here's a really good example of what the industry is working on. Um, this one is from Rockley, the silicon photonics uh, supplier, um, where they've built a, a demo module. I think it's mostly a, a made up one, but um, they come off with electric cables, the yellow cables and blue cables underneath it. So these are electrical cables that are attached directly to, to the module, um, top and bottom of the module. And then on the other two sides, um, they um, have uh, optical engines. So they take, off, take the signals from the main chip, from, from the ASIC, and then they have active chips in here that convert. Um, the electrical signal into, into optical signals, and then they come out in, in fibers. And so that I think really is, is the future. Um, there may be kind of a stepping stone to get from where we are today, which is signals out through BGAs, so these solder balls, to then next maybe these electrical cables, because it's a little bit more intuitive and easier for us to wrap our heads around it. But then uh, silicon photonics is coming uh, right after. Right? And, and the industry is always, well, whoever develops something sec says it, it's needed tomorrow. And um, if we think about 2.5D, that never, like people talked about it for 20 years, right? And everybody said, you need to connect two chips on silicon because you need the fine wiring. And for 20 years, people talked about it. And then, and then eventually it, a triggering moment happened. And that was the creation of the high bandwidth memory, that stack memory that I had on one of the earlier pictures. That all of a sudden had so much advantage to it that everybody wanted it. And now every OSAT, every assembly house in the world 
has multiple technologies and that enable this very, very fine wiring, be it on silicon uh, or, or similar technology. And the same, I think, is happening with um, silicon photonics. Um, I think silicon photonics, people talked for 50 years about already, and uh, nothing has really taken off, at least uh, with this uh, near package optics or, or on package or co-package optics. But um, just looking at what, what the, the graph on the right side tells me is, is that these things, this incredible data rate is coming and it's coming very soon. And there really isn't another path um, to, to get all these signals off. So I think this will be another triggering event. Uh, and I think op, um, silicon photonics and co-package optics um, will get triggered by that event. So um, two, three years, we'll have these uh, 224 gig 30s that will, I think, completely change um, the integration scheme and, and how data um, gets moved moved around data centers and, and everywhere. Good. Um, so with all that complexity in the package, um, there's also a cost piece that becomes really interesting. So the uh, traditional ASIC module is a single chip module. If I think, you know, five, seven years back, there was nothing but single chip modules, meaning just one ASIC and then a substrate. And the cost was roughly 70% in the silicon and 30%, not just package, but package and test. Um, but that was a pretty consistent number to use. Um, and that has completely shifted. And, and I've taken an extreme case here, right? So in this case, uh, this is a real application. We had 70% in the package and only 30% in the chip. Um, this is an extreme case. It's not the normal. It's not, uh, not an average by any stretch of the imagination. But you can see how much things have, have shifted. Right? It's, a, it's a dramatically different world where all of a sudden uh, the packaging and, and uh, package integration, how, how you decide how to integrate things together is a much, much more important part of the whole game. And usually that's driven by um, how you decide what the interface is between the chips. Are you using very few signals that run very fast? Are you, losing, are you using a lot of signals that run very slow? Um, or a combination of multiple uh, approaches, that, that's what decides how complex and expensive a package is. Good. Um, and I wanted to make a point here, I, and this is uh, data I made up just because I wanted to prove it to myself mostly, but I wanted to prove to myself that I can make a chip bigger and make the solution less expensive. So I just started with an arbitrary uh, chip, the blue line is the size, uh, arbitrary chip, and I calculated for a particular configuration what the total um, cost chip and interposer would be, um, and then I tried to shrink it, and I was able to, and I thought that was kind of cool, right? So it's, it, it's not something any chip designer today, or maybe today they think about it, but if, if you think five years ago, not a single chip designer would have thought about can I make the chip bigger and therefore save cost, right? By making something else better. And, but th that's the world we live in now, right? And there's really no design tools that do that yet or, or uh, other toys. This is a lot of, uh, we need to figure out how this chip and packaging all works together. Good, so bottom line of what products need going forward. Products want to be scalable, modular, and flexible. Um, I think what, what they have achieved, what designers have, module designers have achieved over the last couple of years is a one-way street, and there is just going to be more and more of this uh, partitioning and package integration. Um, I stole this chart from uh, Mike Kelly, who's, uh, who's uh, VP at, at Amcor, and I thought it was very, very representative of uh, what happened. Um, he compared it to the old world. The old superhero, Superman, was when we were kids, right? He was, he was the lone warrior, and he carried the torch alone, so just like the single chip. On, on, a, on, a, on a module versus the newer generation of superheroes, they're really groups of superheroes um, that all work together. They all have their individual skills and, and particular things they can do, can do well, or other things maybe not so good. Um, but as, as working together, it, it's a better final um, outcome. And by the way, they, they do also all work for Marvell. 
Um, and then the, the other interesting part was, um, I, I find is, um, if, if you remember Top Gun, there was Maverick and Iceman, they, they started out not so friendly in the movie, but then at the end they came together and, and uh, together beat whatever they had to beat at the time. Um, and, and I think that's also happening um, now where previously unthinkable partnerships um, start evolving, right? If you just think about Intel ordering um, wafers now from TSMC or NVIDIA is buying ARM and ARM in a couple of years will provide processor designs to all of NVIDIA's competitors, right? So, so it's, a, it's a very shifting world and, and um, the previous kind of, uh, he's my partner, he's my enemy, that, that, that world really stopped existing because um, there's gonna be a, a lot more interplay and codependency and um, you wanna get along with all of them. <laughs> Good, I need to watch my time a little bit. Uh, we have about five minutes left. I probably have about five charts left. So I would run slightly over. Dave, I'll defer to you what I should do. Should I run quick or go over? I, I think you can you can go over. I mean, we, we took 10 minutes from you in the beginning, so we can get that back. <laughs> get them back. Okay, good. So I wanted to hit a different uh, theme just for, for a minute here. Um, and that's kind of in the, um, what we all do, right? We all, we all like solving difficult problems. Um, and, and that's what our companies pay us for, right? We are all working in an industry where um, the revenue is higher, the profit margin is higher, and things are difficult to do. That, that's why you get more money for them. Um, and that's how it should be, right? And it's in somewhat exponential um, curve. Um, and I'm a huge fan of, of that, uh, but I'm also a huge fan of, um, you know, kind of open access, um, standardized uh, parts. Uh, standard chiplets, standard integration, um, and and sometimes they don't run in the same direction. Sometimes these two interests of, of higher profit margin um, runs opposite to this open access approach. Um, first, I want to talk about the lower half of that, and then I'll come back to that point. Um, with these chiplets and, and these multiple suppliers that ship components, they all get integrated into one package. There's a lot of challenges with that also. Um, it does need a new business model, right? Who gets paid for what? Who gets the profit margin? Who owns the cost, the yield? Who owns what component until what point in time of the process? Um, also, and, and one of the biggest ones, honestly, is uh, profit margin allocation. Your company wants to hit a certain profit margin, let's just say 50%. Um, and then somebody else creates a big piece of that that's maybe 40% of the value and they ship it to you. Can you really mark it up another 50%? Probably not, right? So it's a really challenging problem for, for, this, for this model. Um, and then it can lead to this commodification of really hard stuff. Um, so, and I wanna explain that a little bit more. So this is um, these, these really beautiful and amazing uh, components that um, I saw at, at an OCP um, forum, a year, well, when we were still allowed to go to conferences a year and a half, two years ago, maybe. Um, one was from Intel, one was from Habana, and then there was also a different one from AMD, Baidu, NVIDIA. They all were designing these um, cards and modules, really complicated solution based on a open spec that uh, Microsoft and Facebook had put out. And they all on their own dime developed these really complicated solutions. And I think where that kind of leads um, is, is this uh, double edged sword of standards. Um, where if you have a standard and you, you go up that really you know, hard to do, you would expect that the value is really high, but then you have to work against all these other competitors that all develop the same thing. So all of a sudden, maybe the value of this is not that high anymore, right? versus where you really want to be is, is uh, kind of be alone in that space that you can solve 
um, and not beating down everybody else who has the same spec and wants to ship it at a lower margin, right? So that's that's the really hard part about this this uh, open technology and everybody uses the same thing. It makes it really really hard to run a business profitable that way. Um, <laughs> this is actually uh, this was me last year. Um, I, I uh, fell off my bicycle. And one of the many things I broke was my collarbone. And I used wanted to use that as an example of uh, somebody really knows how to do profit margins because I asked a friend of mine who's still a real engineer um, what these things would cost if, if you had to make them. And he thought about 50 bucks for that plate and maybe five bucks for that fairly complicated screw with multiple threads on it. Um, then I asked the doctor what, what they pay for it. And he said 900 for the plate and 128 per screw. And then I looked at my bill and it was $12,040 for the components altogether. So I thought that was a great example of somebody still knows how to make money and good margins. So I think that may be my last uh, page, almost last page. But um, if, if we think about where historically we came from on, on the um, between a package engineer and, and a system architect. They were kind of on polar uh, opposite ends of, of a company that there was really no reason to ever talk to each other. And they all, they both had their own expertise. Um, but, but that gets a lot more mingled together now, right? Because of all the dependencies on how do you have multiple chips and have them talk to each other and what interface to use and how complex to make the package. So there's gonna be, they both have to, reach out in, in the other direction and learn a lot more in, in that space because um, that's in that overlapping space is really where the magic happens and where the next generation um, products get born. So I think there's huge opportunity in, in finding that space of overlap and, and being able to talk to both sides. And yeah, that's the new game. In, in my perspective, multi-chip integration, I think we've already given um, the architects uh, these new toys and they're just not going to give them up anymore. I think I've already hit all the points. I'm not going to repeat them uh, here, but the flexibility that we've enabled uh, with, with uh, integrating multiple active chips together um, on, on modules is tremendously powerful um, for both technical solutions, but also commercial solutions. There is huge challenges with how you do that as a business and how, who takes responsibility for what. Who do you work with? How do you work with them? So dif different aspects, but um, um, actually, I think this is like the most exciting time to be in packaging that you could possibly uh, work in, in packaging. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. You didn't ask many questions. I think there was one, so you get the opportunity to, to ask more if you would like. We just stop share. Oh, they put everybody to sleep. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'm just uh, at all. I mean, great talk. I mean, Wolfgang. Um, but you may want to put the, the the profit talk a little down notch a little bit. I mean, we care about money, but we don't talk in front of the people. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Chuck. Hello, Wolfgang. And this may be the time to point out that you can always move to Canada and get socialized medicine and your patient bill will not pay <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's I think that's the issue. It's not so much that he's figured out how to make money, it's that he's in the United States of America. Yeah, 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 yeah. I grew up in Germany. I I yeah, I know. <laughs> so okay, my 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 main question basically comes down to this for those who are going to be students later or those who are just, I don't, know, I don't know, lifelong learners, lifelong doers in the face of lifelong change. If we're not going to go in, in, in the old direction, integrating so many different functions into one module and separating the chips out of chiplets, then as people in academia and industry and government, et cetera, et cetera, that go through their lifelong learning process, are they going to have to go from one day knowing how to do their one job, for example, of doing circuit layout on cadence, 
to having to know basically like Elon Musk with Tesla, for example, every single first principle of every single pure science, as well as chemical materials, just to get a package right so as to not spend. Yeah, no, no, I think that's, that's where this overlap becomes really important and, and that you have people from the process side who, who I mean, I, I had such a hard time when I started with breaking out of my um, packaging world because the words we used had nothing to do with what the chip designers and architects used. It was a completely different vocabulary. And until we start crossing that bridge and learn each other's vocabulary and learn how to talk to each other and learn what's important for each other, then you will never be able to optimize. So do we have to um, learn? Yes, we have, and especially the lifelong learners, I think embrace that approach to, to evolve continuously and, and creep into the neighboring fields. So does each person necessarily have to creep into multiple fields at once? Do we have to sort of pretend like we're startup employees in a large operation? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and actually, the, I never thought about it, but just you asking me the question, if all the people I work with, they all have to understand something about packaging now. Like all of Chuck's people, they all have to learn, know about packaging. Otherwise they cannot do their chip design job if they don't understand packaging. Yeah, so so right now cross-pollination is um, what it takes to do the uh, design work very well, right? So. Doing the PD, if you don't know how to do the pinout, um, which is limited by the packaging, um, you are not going to do you are not going to do well in it. And timing also uh, take the packaging constraint into consideration. I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff. So it, it's just that um, the the complexity of the SOC design force the designer to be vertically integrated. And the, the bigger question then is, as university tuition is getting ever higher and as COVID has caused new budget constraints at the universities, I'm seeing, especially in, in the small university that I went to in Windsor, Ontario, being one of the one of the big examples, but clearly gonna happen everywhere with COVID budget constraints, is that a lot of the more complex topics like to this total vertical integration as let's say a master's or a PhD or postdoc topic are uh, slowly starting to converge in fewer and fewer universities the same way this as a private industry operation is slowly converging into fewer and fewer suppliers. Has that already affected the supply chain in a sense where you're having fewer and fewer people who have let's say 10 different pure sciences required as well as in out and stuff like that. Is, is the lane starting to disappear or, or are you seeing the lane starting to disappear and that people starting to disappear with it? Um, so uh, let me make sure I understand the question correctly. Are you asking if, if like in a company like Marvell, do the deep experts disappear? Is that your question? Basically, do, are you seeing that happen over time? Because what I'm seeing in, on the academia side is that the projects in which those can for the projects for students to gain experience in that area are starting to disappear because of recent budget constraints, you know, with the chip ban being coming more expensive and now with COVID constraints. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. starting to disappear on the academia and gradual. It's not, obviously not totally gone, but are you seeing that on your end as uh, new engineers are coming in that uh, through no fault of their own, that the yeah. is it's, it's a hard question to answer, honestly. Um, on, on the one hand, um, I, 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 I see what you're asking um, and I kind of, I know very, very few like fundamental researchers we work with anymore because we're like more becoming more generalists. I think that's kind of your, your point, right? And on, on the other hand, um, all the people we're hiring, I, I see resumes and they just, students today are just amazing. They're just so much better than we were, than I was. <laughs> so, so I think it's a little bit of both. I think the yeah, fundamental research doesn't happen so much, at least not, I mean, we used to be IBM, right? We used to, we used to, used to research everybody. We hired every PhD, um, but um, I don't see that so much anymore, but 
we're more generalists, but on the other hand, this, the people we hire, um, amazing. Yeah, good. Well, I just want to add on to that, right? So, so right now, nowadays, I think the applicants that we come across, at least the ones that we are um, highly interested in, are the ones that who are willing to work outside of their comfort zone, right? I mean, so at IBM, I don't know about you, Wolfgang, but um, a lot of time I come across people who are very comfortable and wanting to work in silo. Mm -hmm. And in the new landscape of the chip design, as you heard from Wolfgang today, um, the complexity kind of forces everybody to, you know, no longer, I mean, can work in a silo mode. They have to engage other stakeholders throughout the design value chain and make sure um, everything at, when I get, get in the hands of customer is up and function. And also at the time limit, um, this, the one thing that um, Wolfgang touched on is become complexity forced that the development cycle go longer and longer and longer, but the customer still expect their chip will be done within two year time span. That's from the concept phase all the way up to the GA of the chip. It gotta be done within two years. So how do you force that schedule onto the development team? Well, the developer have to know, I mean, who to ask the right questions to. Cross-pollination, I think is the key. I keep telling the new hire today, you know, cross-pollination is the key to success. They have to be able to engage other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Dave, I, I look at the time. Right now it's nine o'clock on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, Wolfgang, it's pretty late for you. Sorry. <laughs> maybe can maybe we can do one more two questions, and maybe we have to call it for night. Is that okay with you, Dave? That, that sounds sounds very appropriate. So I, I have a question about reliability. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of comment on? what you do to address reliability in these large packages when you have all sorts of disparate dye being attached and relying on each of those to be known good dye when you use them and how long they'll last. Um, can can, can yeah. I actually, sorry, can I jump on that too? Because I had a similar question in regards to testing those individual chips. So maybe, mm -hmm. maybe the two can be somewhat related. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. It's maybe easier to answer that way actually. Um, so, um, the first step is, is test, yeah, to get a good population in. And, and so there is, um, instead of the historical process, which was one temperature, one test, uh, ship it um, now, because you risk taking down so much other content if, if you assemble it together. Um, there is now much, much more content in the test. Uh, there is much uh, multiple test temperatures and much more adaptive. There may also be certain rules about um, you know, if one chip fails, do you really want the neighbor, or would you rather not uh, take that risk, or are you closer to the edge of the wafer? Do you really want that chip, even if it tested well? So these are all uh, strategies that 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 get used um, near as neighbor and at proximity, etc., um, to to determine a, a better population. Um, but then, then w once you assemble it, of course, you want to test very well again afterwards. Um, the requirements haven't really changed in what um, a packaged part needs to survive. So all the genetic stresses are really the same. Um, and and um, that is mostly done at the O sets and quite well um, to determine the material sets earlier before they use. So we, we push a lot of these discussions into roadmap discussions with all the OSITs we work with and tell them, you know, we see on the horizon in two years, we will need the 105 millimeter package. You better have that ready. And we think a CTE of whatever 12 or 13 may be okay, but we can't tolerate warpage higher than whatever 200 microns. Um, so I think this, this early engagement, um, stating the criteria, stating where you need to be and working across the, the supply chain um, is, is the, the, solves the package reliability question of it. Any last question for Wolfgang? I, I guess I maybe if you, if you have 30 seconds more, um, the uh, what, what's your biggest challenge with the integration of, of the optical interface? 
Oh, <laughs> so uh, great question. So I don't know if uh, you saw the announcement, Marvell is buying Infi um, and um, for $10 billion. So sorry, Jack, sorry, money talk again. But um, that tells you that there is something really valuable in somebody who has that capability, who knows how to design silicon photonics dye and, and make them real. So I think that's probably all I'll be able to say. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, I th thank you very much on, on behalf of the, the Southern Minnesota section. I really appreciate your, the time that you, that you gave us tonight. Um, there was another question um, asking for an email address. Uh, do you have any problem if I if I send that? We won't we won't say it here in the because it's, like I said we'll we'll put this in the um, out to out to YouTube. But if you don't mind, I'll, I I can respond to that one um, and send them your email address if that's all right. I'll stick it right in there. Here we go. Hopefully all right. All right. Um, again, thank you very much. Um, thanks for all those that, that, that spent their night with us tonight. I, I know you probably missed out on some, some great uh, NCAA basketball, but I'm sure that's recorded too. You can, you can catch up on those highlights as well. Uh, and and it, it, you, you had some, some great lines in there that I laughed out loud at. I just want you to know that because uh, <laughs> I, I know in this, this Zoom setting, unfortunately, uh, you know, like I said, we're all, we're all sitting here muted. Had that been in a, in a live room, I think, I think you would have had a, a few, a better response. Um, so, so th th thank well, you very much. Saying that. that makes me feel good. <laughs> I'm sure my team will enjoy tomorrow's, but, and they will be confounded by, wait a minute, what do you mean Chuck work? He never work around here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would have been one of those times. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, with that, again, I, I, I thank you very much. And, uh, um, and to, the, to those that are on the, on the recording, look for our, or to those that are on the session, uh, look for our, our future meetings as well. Great, thanks for Have a good night. Sorry for running over, yeah. All right, bye everybody.